discussion today will be on COVID reflections and the way forward. Before I introduce both guests, I wanted to give some words on today's format. I'm Punita Kumar Sinha, Chairperson of Incred AMC, and I will spend 30 to 40 minutes discussing with our two panelists um, about COVID and their thoughts. After that, our Healthcare Pharma Fund Manager, um, Aditya Kemka, is going to ask a few questions and then moderate the Q&A from the audience. This webinar will be recorded. So we have with us two very, very distinguished guests to shed some light on this very important and critical topic, Dr. Ivers and Dr. Karim. A brief introduction of both our guests. Dr. Ivers is Interim Chief, Division of Infectious Diseases, Executive Director, Center for Global Health at Mass General Hospital, and a professor at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Ivers is also involved in global policy and advocacy work to improve health equity. She has served as an advisor to the WHO and the Haitian Ministry of Health, and is a delegate to the Global Task Force for Cholera Control at WHO. Additionally, Dr. Ivers has worked on healthcare delivery in India, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Dr. Ivers has won many awards, including the 2019 Harvard School of Public Health Award for Leadership in Practice of Public Health. Our second very distinguished guest is Dr. Current. He's the chairman and consultant, critical care medicine at Manipal Hospitals. He's an expert in the management of all types of critically ill patients needing ICU care, including mechanical ventilation in uses of devices like EMCO. He has authored many chapters in national and international textbooks pertaining to critical care medicine. Also, he has numerous research publications in both national and international journals. Dr. Karanth is trained both in India and overseas. He's a senior national faculty in various regional, national, and international conferences. Dr. Karan has been in the trenches dealing with critically ill COVID patients and is also on a COVID task force in India. A very good morning to you, Dr. Ivers. You're joining us very early in the morning from Boston. Thank you very much. And good evening to you, Dr. Karan. Thank you both for joining us today. My first question is to you, Dr. Ivers. As you know, India has gone through a very devastating second wave. How do you place it in a global context and compare it to US and UK? Yeah, first, I thank you very much for inviting me to join you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been really heart wrenching for me here many, many thousands of miles away to see what my colleagues are going through on the front lines of providing care. And we have many Indian and Indian American colleagues here in Boston who've been dealing with family and friends. So I really wanted to express my um, empathy towards the situation you know when you look at the number of cases per million that you've been having in recent weeks in india it's clearly way up there in the top of the global scale in terms of numbers we are seeing similar per population numbers in countries like brazil in colombia in latin america but obviously with such a large population uh, india is contributing a large number of cases when we look at the uh, at the global map and then unfortunately Unfortunately, of course, reaching this terrible milestone of having 300,000 reported deaths. So I think what we've seen in other countries is surges like this, but obviously with such a large population, just the devastation and the human toll really so much more profound uh, in your country. Hmm. No, UK was very um, also hit very hard by the B117 variant. Do you think that this B617 variant is more vicious? You know, it seems to, when I think about outbreaks in any scenario, you think about the virus itself in this scenario, and then the social context in which the pathogen, the virus, is finding itself. And it's hard to distinguish sometimes exactly how much each piece is contributing. It certainly seems as, that, as though the 617 variant is very infectious and maybe twice as infectious, maybe twice as transmissible. Uh, and I think you also have to look at where that virus finds itself. So for example, we are having um, some of both the variant 617, the 117 in the US, but because of our social context and our vaccine context now, we're not seeing the same level of impact of the same variant. So I think it is important to think about 
the variants. And I think we'll probably talk more about that during this time, especially because we worry about future variants and, them, and the vaccines not working for them or tests perhaps being more challenging for certain variants. But I also think it's important to think of the variant and all of the components of public health that we know still work for the variants, whatever the variants are. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we'll come back to uh, the discussion of variants uh, with you uh, later, but I wanted to turn to Dr. Karan. Dr. Karan, how are you seeing this variant versus the one we saw in the first wave in India? And this variant seems to be affecting younger men in urban areas more than women. Um, do you have any um, thing you can share with us on that? Uh, thank you uh, for having me in. Uh, so I think uh, part of that question has already been on, answered by Professor Ivers. Uh, so I think whenever we talk about a, a virus and its infectivity or any uh, microorganism and its infectivity, the context would be the pathogen, the host and the social factors. So certainly the mutation has occurred and there is reasonable data to say that this is probably uh, twice as infective as the UK variant and four times as infective as the virgin strain which started off the pandemic. I think that's one factor. The second factor is, of course, uh, it is definitely affecting the younger population as we have seen. If you look at the data from the first wave, 20 to 25 percent of, uh, or in some uh, states and cities, it was about 30 percent of the uh, patients were under the age of 40. Uh, but the data from the ICMR and from uh, my own state in Karnataka today, the young population of under 45 is around nearing 40% in the second wave. So certainly, as you have rightly put it, there are younger people who are getting infected this time. And uh, it is cutting across all straight off economic straight off society. I think that's another uh, another uh, important uh, sort of uh, factor which is playing a role in this uh, uh, in this pan, uh, in this wave, if I may say, uh, so I think both these factors, the greater virulence and the fact that we are seeing it infecting the younger population, is the big stark difference which is coming across in this second wave. And also, as you have seen in the media, there are more younger children who are getting infected, and that is what is based, that is what is making us predict that the third wave is likely to hit the younger population. Now, if you may ask, uh, why? What is the reason for this? I think uh, a couple of social factors may also be playing a role. One is, of course, the vaccination pattern. We have vaccinated the frontline healthcare workers and the elderly people or the above 45 were targeted in the first wave of vaccination. And uh, that has let the uh, younger generation who are actually the people who step out of the house and are in, uh, in the livelihood activity to actually uh, get the infection and probably bring it home. But they are more susceptible and vulnerable because of the fact that they have not been vaccinated. So they are the unvaccinated uh, population who are uh, uh, more directly exposed to the virus because of the activities or the livelihood activities and the fact that they step out of house. And of course, uh, I should admit that there is a certain amount of callousness which has also been, which has also crept in in the uh, way people or society behaved in the last few months. Mm. No, very valid point. Um, but do you think that this variant has developed in a way that is also getting past uh, the Indian immune systems and then will it also affect um, the globally vaccinated or the, you know, other countries um, who also have, um, you know, perhaps this variant emerge, will that, but do you think this is going to kind of create a global problem? Okay, so uh, I think the data for that to be categorically saying that this particular variant is causing more trouble is still a little sketchy. We probably need more data. Some early signs do suggest that some of the vaccines may not be as efficacious uh, but we, but there is a, uh, definitely it is efficient. It's not that they are not, uh, and we know that the mRNA virus based mRNA based vaccines still have reasonably good efficacy for uh, this vaccine. So, but I think we need the data is still coming out. Uh, I'm subject to correction by uh, Professor Ivers uh, if there's anything. But as far as we know, there could be some early suggestion that the efficiency of some of the vaccines may be uh, 
little shade lesser but having said that i think this is not an answer or this is not a reason for not getting vaccinated i think more and more people get vaccinated you will find that the cumulative efficiency of the vaccine continues to increase and as we learn more about the vaccine as we have seen uh, the spacing of the two doses we have increased so as our experience with the vaccine and the disease gets better we will probably have uh, uh, more data on that but on the whole i think uh, vaccines are efficient maybe a shade lesser but they are definitely efficient and i think the drive to continue efficient vac uh, uh, aggressively vaccinating uh, people needs to be continued mm. yeah and i think um, before we go into vaccinations which is a topic by itself which we'll do later uh, just staying on the point of the variants um, dr ivers what new variants do you see emerging and what countries do you think and places and geographies do you think it would emerge from and where would the next hotspot potentially be that we should be worried about? Yeah, I mean, I think trying to predict what variants will emerge is a big activity at the moment. I don't know that I can predict what's going to emerge, but I do think that when you look at the B617 variant and see that it had a couple of mutations that had been present in other mutations and now came together, one has to be very um, uh, uh, aggressive, let's say, in doing the surveillance that's required to identify variants. Because obviously we're having mutations of the virus all the time. And sometimes those mutations have absolutely no impact on the clinical scenario for the virus. And so part of the difficulty to even answer your question is that as the virus is mutating, we don't really know yet exactly which mutations are going to give it an advantage in humans. And so it's just perniciously continuing to replicate and any advantage that it gets, it will proceed along that line. So I think in terms of where the mutations will emerge, I think they're going to continue to emerge wherever the virus is replicating without um, being stopped. So the, the mutations I think will continue to emerge in any of the countries or geographies or communities, even within countries where there are unvaccinated people who are coming together and transmitting from one to the other. So this is why, as Dr. Karanth is saying, vaccination is really the way to prevent mutations. The more people who are vaccinated, the less chance the virus is transmitted and therefore the less chance that it has to replicate. So it's a little hard to exactly predict, but if you look at other countries around the world, other continents, I think you know the continent of Africa is also overall um, far fewer percentage of the population vaccinated than in some countries in US, UK, um, and so in Europe. So I think we've heard Africa CDC leaders see what's happening in India and say, this is a wake up call for the continent and we have to double down on our uh, activities, our public health activities for concern and for fear of emergence um, of further surges there. We saw a variant um, P1 that was coming out of um, large surge of cases in Brazil, very uh, infectious and seemed to have some reduced impact from the vaccine. So I think anywhere we're seeing big surges, we're going to see new vari variants emerge. Mm. So the solution. Uh, just to add to what uh, Professor Weiver said, I think we, uh, as uh, as mankind, one thing we need to understand is uh, mutations are a natural process of evolution for the virus. So we cannot stop that. I think the only protection we can offer ourselves is by boosting our immunity, which is by either a vaccine or by actually better herd immunity, which is going to be a combination of uh, aggressive vaccination and, of course, infection of the population. So I think we need to understand that, you know, uh, to answer the question that, you know, where it will come, uh, it's unpredictable, as uh, Professor Ivers mentioned. It can happen anywhere. It could, again, happen in a situation where uh, people have been vaccinated and you might find that the vaccine is ineffective. We hope it doesn't happen, but I think the more and more you vaccine, vaccinate, the less and less it will happen. And the transmissibility of the virus is the one which determines uh, the, the mutation. Mm. So, I mean, since we're talking so much about vaccination, maybe I'll jump to that section right now. Um, now, in the U.S. Uh, itself, Dr. Ivers, there have been some states which are about 60% vaccinated and some are only 30% vaccinated. 
And so there is no consistency even in um, US, but there people have let their guard down as well. And um, uh, people are now uh, not required to wear masks in the areas where there have been uh, vaccinations. But uh, hearing from you all, this, uh, this you know, variant <clears throat> can get past um, various, you know, even the vaccinated people. So why are we letting our guard down and letting people take off their masks, even if they are vaccinated? Well, I think the U.S., you know, has had a very complicated and not always very good at all response to the pandemic. I mean, we are up there in the world as the highest number of deaths. And, you know, I, I can't say there's been too much. I mean, there have been pockets of great success and great science, but on a public health level, not exactly the model. However, one of the things that the US has been successful at is kind of aggressively trying to vaccinate our way out of the crisis. Now that has had impact on other parts of the world, by the way, which we can come back to. But I think to answer your question, what the public health guidance now in the United States is that vaccinated people could go unmasked. But there's still a recommendation that people who are unvaccinated should continue to wear masks particularly when they're indoors. And this has actually created a little confusion here in the last couple of weeks because the message from our CDC, Centers for Disease Control, was very clearly that vaccinated people could unmask. But really, I think that gave a lot of um, freedom to people who were unvaccinated to perhaps think that they could also go unmasked. Now, the reason why is that despite our concerns about variants, so far, the vaccines largely used in the US, which have been the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine and the Janssen vaccine, have seemed to be still effective against the variants that are mostly circulating in the US. So the variants mostly circulating in the US are the 117, otherwise known as the UK strain, and some P1, the, the Brazil strain, a little bit of the 617, but not as much. So our public health guidance is that so far, the vaccines are so effective. And because we have such a relatively high overall rate of people who've gotten at least one dose, there was a big push to kind of let those people who were vaccinated feel like they could take some release from the restrictions they had putting, been putting themselves under. But in, pra in practice, I think, as you said, this advice to vaccinated people maybe gave a little bit of liberty to people who were yet unvaccinated. And what I'll also say is that even though our caseload is going down very much, if you separate out our vaccinated people from our unvaccinated people, we actually still have a relatively high rate of infection among the unvaccinated and a relatively consistent death rate among unvaccinated. So what we're really going to start seeing is this kind of separation of the pandemic and pockets of communities or people who are not vaccinated continue to get infected, whereas those who are vaccinated are to the large extent still protected with very, very, very few breakthrough infections despite the variants. So just um, a follow-up question to that and then I'll come back to Dr. Karan. <clears throat> uh, what is the response you think to the Indian variant of Pfizer and Moderna? And uh, you said there hasn't been much study, but if new variants like those keep coming, um, how certain are you that these vaccinations are gonna be effective? So I think there's kind of two approaches to studying that. One is in the laboratory where scientists create pseudoviruses based on the variants and then they look at neutralizing antibodies in kind of in vitro in a control science, you know, laboratory environment. And then the second approach is to look in public health. Okay, if we're vaccinating actual people, are they actually getting infection? So far, we don't really have enough real world evidence to be 100% certain about the vaccination in the public health, but based on the laboratory studies, which are ongoing and still new and still emerging, it does seem as though antibodies are being created or able to be created to neutralize the variant, the 617 variant. So I think the, the initial evidence that I have seen, and I look to Dr. Kranth for his opinion here too, seems that 
for the moment, the concern, at least for the Janssen vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, those are the, those are the ones that I have seen um, some papers about, and also AstraZeneca, that there is expected to be effectiveness of the vaccines against that variant. What might happen in the future with future variants or what might happen in the real world setting, I think we're still tentative to try to be able to understand. Mm. So Dr. Grant, just to, your view? Yeah, just to add uh, uh, to what Dr. Professor Ivers said, uh, I think uh, we, I did touch upon this on the previous or the question prior as well. Uh, so I think there is not much data yet to say that they are ineffective completely. Uh, they may be less effective, perhaps, a shade less effective, if I may say. Uh, now, unpublished data from our own setting, what we have seen in the last uh, one and a half months or six weeks of the second wave, uh, and the experience that we have had with the first wave, uh, as you know, healthcare workers and frontline workers were vaccinated in our country as the first uh, you know, as the first wave or the first sort, uh, uh, first set of uh, uh, citizens who are vaccinated. So, if you look at the intensity of the infection this time, the numbers of infection this time, we have less than fifteen percent of the original number of people who were uh, actually infected among healthcare workers. Uh, so, if uh, for every hundred patients that we see. Uh, this is, a, I'm just talking of my hospital data, which is also reflected uh, in unpublished report across. We see very, very few uh, healthcare workers who have actually, uh, one, got an infection, or number two, got severe infection. So what we need to understand is that vaccines do not give 100% protection to all, but it gives what we call a 70 to 80 percent or 60 to 8 75 percent protection which is decreases that much in infection but at the same time decreases the uh, severity of the infection i think at the end of the day it is efficiency is not measured only in terms of decreasing infections and mort but it also means decreasing mortality so i think those are the two things that we need to understand and there is very good data both from i mean we have we are still working on our data and a lot of other centers are looking at that as well we do understand that we there is enough and more uh, suggestion that vaccinated people have much lower incidence of infection or lower incidence of severe infection and uh, when we cut across our uh, uh, patients who came to us this time into the icu uh, we have noted that more uh, there's only two patients of about more than 300 who are fully vaccinated who needed ICU, of which uh, there was only one who went on a ventilator and no deaths. I mean, this again is unquote unpublished data, but we are still looking at it. I think that says it all, that uh, vaccines are effective. And we know that the second wave uh, is uh, largely from the B617 uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, virus uh, mutant uh, variant. And uh, uh, of course, I don't have uh, data from uh, regional areas to say which is our strain, et cetera. But whatever data we have is most infections, more than 85% of infections in the second wave are coming from this new double variant and uh, double mutant uh, variant. And therefore, I think uh, that answers the question that it is efficient, uh, maybe or may not be less efficient. We need more data. And also, if you look at the epidemiology that uh, or demographics of our patients, more younger people are getting infected as compared to the last lot where we had elderly patients with chronic kidney disease and a whole lot of other things who were targeted uh, for uh, vaccination in this, uh, uh, you know, prior to the second wave. So uh, it certainly means that the vaccine is effective, whether it is less or more, I think uh, we need more uh, clinical or real world evidence for that. Of course, we see on TV, a lot of uh, prominent doctors with both vaccinations having been impacted and passing away. So, um, but you're right that maybe the numbers are smaller uh, versus if they had not been vaccinated. Um, also, you know, in uh, Dr. Karanth, we've um, seen anecdotal data that people who got the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine have antibodies and they do the antibody testing of 400 plus, but people who've taken the co-vaccine, the antibodies are only showing up between 13 to 15. Um, how do you explain this disparity? Yeah. Uh, so two things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the antibody response, uh, what we measure, which is actually uh, what we call the spike protein antibody, uh, may not necessarily always translate into clinical ground realities that the efficiency of the vaccine is down, number one. 
Number two, yes, uh, if you look at the modus operandi or mechanism and how the mRNA works and how the uh, Covaxin and the uh, COVID shield work, which is more based on a uh, on the neutralizing antibody uh, theory, uh, you would find that there is going to be a difference. So it is likely that the antibody response for the mRNA is more because we are actually targeting the genetic, in, uh, the integral part of the virus, which is the genetic material, as compared to the spike protein, which is looking at the peripheral uh, or the spike protein, glycoprotein itself of the virus, which is the envelope of uh, the viral particle. Uh, so it is. Uh, it, there could be a difference in the efficiency, but I think just by measuring the uh, height of the antibody response, it is a little difficult to say that on in real world it is not effective. In fact, if you look at data from Covaxin itself, initially we they said sixty five to seventy, and today we are talking about eighty to eighty five percent efficiency. The same thing in real world evidence is uh, true for the AstraZeneca Covid Shield as well. We find that compared to the initial studies which came out. Uh, in the earlier part of the year to now, which is the real world evidence we are talking about uh, with the uh, you know, uh, data from the UK, we do find that the efficiency seems to be much more effective uh, of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine as it was thought to be two months ago. Uh, the third thing that we need to understand is as more and more uh, people get vaccinated, you do find that the efficiency of the vaccine starts getting better and better. So I think there are a number of factors when we talk about efficiency. So it's not only a mere number of number of infections, mortality, et cetera, but as I said, it is also how many of them have severe infection, how many less people are getting infected, how many need ICU. So all these things do matter. So I think just looking at an antibody response, which is more of a sort of an in vitro or a post vaccination kind of a data, we have to look at it in the real world because usually the real world data may be better or worse when we talk about for most therapeutic interventions. So you're saying that even if the antibody response to Covaxin is low, and those in India who've taken Covaxin um, will not be um, as, you know, will uh, be almost as safe as those who've taken a Moderna or a Pfizer, um, broadly speaking? Yeah, I would not say as much. There could be a 10, 15 percent def difference, definitely, because we know that even from the studies, the best efficiency we talk about with both Covaxin and Covishield is around 80 to 85 percent with appropriate timelines taken, uh, the appropriate gap between the two doses and the post second dose timing, which is about four to six weeks. Uh, when the full efficiency of the vaccine is seen. And we also know that from the uh, mRNA data, we already knew that it is about 94 to 95% efficient. So definitely the efficiency, as we know today from the Moderna and the Pfizer is a little higher, about 10% more. Uh, but um, I think uh, we do have logistical uh, implications as well. Uh, because both Moderna and uh, Pfizer, of course, now the things have changed to maintain the cold chain of minus 70 degree in a hot, humid, tropical country or a temperate country like India is also going to be difficult. So it is not only looking at the efficiency, but also, uh, as uh, Professor Ivor said, the real world uh, use and the real world uh, practical application of a vaccine is also very, very important. Uh, so I think 10% or 15% this way and that way is not going to make such a big difference. Uh, I think we need to understand that and uh, take what vaccine comes our way and which is available. Only thing what we need to ensure is that both doses of the vaccine are of the same uh, type, but even that is now changing as there are some early reports coming out from uh, the Western world, which is showing that mixing of two different vaccines seem to be as efficacious in, in, a, in a specifically with respect to Pfizer and uh, Covishield, but I think we need more data to uh, about mixing other kind of uh, uh, vaccine shots. Right, in fact, I've heard of some people who are going from India, um, say overseas, and they find that the Covaxin has given them only 13 or 15. So they're going and taking a Pfizer or a Moderna overseas, thinking it'll boost this cross vaccination, will boost their antibodies. Dr. Ivers, any views on that? Yeah, I, I endorse and agree with Dr. Karanth. In fact, here, the um, our FDA recently recommended against checking antibodies as a measure because, you know, we had we had some folks who were measuring antibodies, wondering about their individual response, and it's really not recommended to be checking that. I think in addition, I would 
elaborate on what, what Dr. Kran said by saying that there are you know, different components to immunity and measuring antibodies is just one type of the immunity that we hope the vaccines induce. There are other kinds of immunity related to T cells and B cells, and uh, those are not measured by antibodies. So I think it can become a little bit um, just distracting perhaps to be overly worried about initially the antibody as a measure of, of the response. We don't really know, perhaps in the future, we'll have better understanding from research of how well the antibody level actually maps to protection. But for now, what we're seeing for, for all of these vaccines is that they're very effective against death and hospitalization. And so if you think about, there is kind of, there are kind of two needs of a vaccine. There's a public health need where you want to try to reduce the rate of the infection in your community, in your country, in the world, because the less the less virus that's circulating, the less anyone is, at, is likely to get it. And so you want to have overall just as much dampening of the likelihood of infection as possible in the community. And then obviously there's the individual protection. You know, if I get vaccinated, I want to protect myself as high as possible. I'm not always just thinking about my neighbors there. So I think that's where it gets into, well, is it 85% or is it 90%? But considering how um, serious the infection is without a vaccine. I think, you know, as Dr. Grant said, any vaccine that can take your own risk of being hospitalized or dying from, you know, X level all the way down by 95 or, or 85% is a really, is a good vaccine to get. Mm -hmm. So, um uh, a few questions on the treatment protocols. Dr. Karant, um, I'm going to ask you this question. Why are some of the treatment protocols in India different than the rest of the world? For instance, in India, people are using ivermectin, which is not used globally. Also, remdesivir uh, is being used um, quite a lot in India. And in, in fact, the treatment protocols differ between cities. So in Mumbai, I'm hearing there's much less use of remdesivir, but in Delhi, there's a lot more. Um, and also plasma therapy, I don't hear much of that being used in some other countries as we do in India. So I'd like to hear um, your views on the treatment protocols in India and whether they're consistent enough and why they're different than global and then hear Dr. Ivers' view on the treatment protocols that we've been using in India. Uh, so you asked about four or five questions. I hope I can get the order right. Uh, <laughs> so the first one was about, I'll start with the simple uh, ivermectin drug. So there is good data to say that ivermectin has very good virucidal activity in vitro. Uh, especially in very high doses, uh, there's a very the, there is a good mechanism and what we call as biological plausibility of how it works. Uh, the second thing is it is a very simple, cheap, economical drug which is available and can be used very easily in settings where uh, even in a kind of a, a primary health center and you know very uh, uh, interior parts of the nation, rural areas, it's very easily uh, uh, something that can be used. Now, there is data from both Western literature, world literature, what we call as meta-analysis studies, which have shown that ivermectin uh, is uh, useful, not only in treatment, but also in prophylaxis. In fact, uh, uh, one of our uh, very uh, famed uh, uh, critical care experts from the US itself has also done a study who has said that you know the uh, it is a very effective treatment. In fact, people went to the extent of even saying that if everybody in the world is given ivermectin, we can put probably put an end to the pandemic. Uh, I think that is probably taking it a little too far. We don't have probably that much data to support its use. But there are small studies from the Indian subcontinent as well, which has shown that ivermectin may be efficacious. Now, we could go on debating about the pros and cons or the usefulness or the non-usefulness of these medications till the cows come home. But I think uh, to put it very uh, in summary, three, two or three points. Ivermectin is a safe drug. It is very easily procured and can be and quite economical. And therefore, whatever the benefit it can offer for mild disease, um, we can use it because there is good biological plausibility. As I said, in vitro data or data from outside human studies in the labs have shown it to be useful. So that's one about ivermectin. Secondly, coming to the question that, you know, is the treatment protocol highly varied? I will go to remdesivir later. I think I'll touch with the protocol part of it uh, as a second uh, question or a second answer to your question. 
Now, the MOHW has given uh, guidelines. I should admit there's been no recent uh, modification in the guidelines, but I think the initial guidelines which have come have gone a few have undergone a few revisions. But of late, I think we are busy fighting the sector, firefighting the uh, essentials of oxygen and other uh, drugs. So therefore, probably we have not gone to revisit some of our old protocols that we went through the first uh, wave. But each and every state has had the, I mean, based on a federal structure, has the empowerment to look at their own local sort of uh, needs, requirements, availability, and use it uh, with adequate local modification. Like in Karnataka, we do have a, a technical committee or the task force which goes through the national guidelines and does make uh, local modifications. As you know, UP have, and uh, one or two states in the uh, in northern India were uh, the sort of pioneers to push ivermectin. Now, ivermectin has come into some of the southern states as well. So. Uh, I think uh, every uh, state has its own uh, minor modification that can be used based on their technical expertise, based on the availability. And uh, to some extent, I think we are talking about a pandemic uh, emotion, a pandemic psyche, which is very important to address that as well many a time. Uh, so, you know, sitting in a technical committee in an ivory tower, it's very easy for us to say that, uh, you know, I will not do this and I will not do that. But when but, but, but the same me from the ivory tower come down and as you said, sitting in the trenches, firing at the, at the virus and seeing people coming and dying in front of me, I think I would do anything and everything, including uh, probably non-modern medicine sometimes. Uh, not that I've done it, you know. It is, it's just a matter of, I think, uh, playing on the public psyche as well, which we need to respect many a time that, okay, I'm giving you something on a video consultation which I can use. So I think that way there are certain local modifications which are being done according to the availability of the expertise and the medications. So what the, about plasma therapy? Yeah, I'll come to Remdesivir next. So Remdesivir, um, I do agree, I think has been rampantly misused, if I may say, uh, in India. And I think that is what is one of the reasons why we are actually struggling to actually cover uh, or get this demand sorted now. Because right from the recovery trial, uh, two uh, number of uh, guidelines have indicated that remdesivir has a role very early in the disease for moderate to uh, moderate disease, not even for mild. So we had a very clear guideline which said that somebody ends up needing oxygen, you start remdesivir, somebody ends up on a ventilator or not needing oxygen, remdesivir is of not of much use. Or somebody comes after 10 days, you know, remdesivir has no role, but people just went on prescribing remdesivir as if, as if it was the uh, panacea for all evils of corona. And as you know, today we are struggling the scenario where there is no remdesivir available at all. Uh, the fifth one about plasma therapy, absolutely no evidence to support its use. Um, it is only used in certain times uh, in individual uh, on an individual basis, which we do use when there is a excessive demand from the family sometimes to again to play to the uh, family's emotions, but otherwise absolutely no role. There is enough and more evidence to say that it is uh, it's of uh, no clinical consequence at all. And Dr. Ivers, uh, how do you see the treatment protocols in India? I've spoken to doctors in the UK and on ivermectin, and for instance, they say, oh, it's, this is a medicine for lice and parasites. <laughs> and uh, how come Indian doctors are using this? So your view on the protocols that are being used in India, and how is that different than what was done in the US in the midst of the, you know, uh, the surge? Yeah, I think... I think that's the key thing. In in March and April of 2020, when we were having a, our first surge, and we had you know globally very little information about what worked and what didn't work from trials, we kind of gave our patients, you know, we say here the kitchen sink. You know, we you, as a doctor, you you don't want to have your patient die in front of you if you think that ivermectin might work or hydroxychloroquine, and if they have relatively few side effects, we tended to kind of do an all-in approach. Since that time, our protocols have definitely evolved and changed. So here in the US and uh, the, the National Institutes of Health and the FDA and also the European Medicines Agency would say that there's no reason to recommend ivermectin. So generally speaking, we don't use ivermectin. However, we are in a more fortunate situation in that we have not had stockouts of remdesivir, say. So I think what's happened to us is that we've moved 
in the US, we moved from a let's try everything and ivermectin, as you say, is typically used to uh, manage parasitic disease. However, as Dr. Kran said, there is some laboratory suggestion that it has antiviral therapy. So there was antiviral effects. So there was certainly a premise for its use. And I think, you know, but we have totally moved out of favor of using ivermectin. So we don't use ivermectin for our patients, but we do have remdesivir quite readily available. So our protocol would call for patients whose oxygen level dips to a certain amount to get a certain course of remdesivir, to get a certain course of steroids, but not to use ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. But I do appreciate how in a crisis and the context of wanting to do something, people tend to give prescriptions, but that is not um, what, what we're recommending right now. I think ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine have become you know, two of the most studied pharmaceuticals ever. And I know there's a, um, a new, another multi-center trial that was just started recently to look at this, because obviously if we had an oral antiviral therapy, this could be a game changer for the world, you know, and we could use vaccination as a public health tool and an intervention as a pharmaceutical to actually treat our patients. Because obviously a vaccine is only preventing, but we want to be able to treat the people we, we our patients that we see, but we would very much um, steer away from that. For us, convalescent plasma has been the more controversial. Overall, I'd say a good, majority of um, my colleagues would say that there's not a major benefit or indication for convalescent plasma. That would be my interpretation of the literature, especially because most of the time we find the patient too far, too far ahead of their disease and giving them kind of undifferentiated plasma is not necessarily that helpful. But there are still some scenarios in which we would prescribe it, especially if we had, for example, a profoundly immunosuppressed patient or in some cases for compassionate juice, what we would call compassionate juice. And um, so there's probably still a few people who are prescribing that, but overall there's less, um, there's, it's, it's less in favor than it was, say, nine months ago when we were in the first or second uh, surges that we had. And Dr. Ivers, do you also prescribe to home isolated patients like we do in India, uh, doxycycline or some of the antibiotics? No, we also had a period where we would prescribe azithromycin or doxycycline, and we do not tend to do that now as part of our protocols. Mm. So Dr. Karan, why do we prescribe those in India? Yeah, so I, so I think I've already answered that question. Yes, the evidence for it is very, very low, uh, but I think uh, based on, again, the biological possibility and the fact that there is some in vitro lab data to say that it is useful, and does have a good viricidal activity, uh, we still do use it and a relatively benign drug, both of them. And that's the reason, uh, you know, we use it. And again, uh, you know, the comfort of a video consult is still very, very new to the Indian public and for that matter to the Indian treating doctor as well. So I think when you're sitting across uh, a few kilometers away, uh, you know, seeing somebody on a screen, which we are, uh, you know, still in the learning curve, I think we, we, it makes both the doctor as well as the treating person feel comfortable that we are giving them something to treat. And uh, you know, when something comes in a guideline, it is always uh, difficult to ignore it and say that I will not do anything at all. So as of today, it is the guideline uh, in many states, including uh, uh, the state that, where I come from. And uh, therefore, I think uh, we are uh, sort of uh, cajoled into giving that uh, uh, and ensuring that something is prescribed to the to the patient. Now, just to answer that question in a slightly more uh, uh, pragmatic sense, uh, to be very honest, you know, not many viral infections do actually have treatment. Most of the time being in an ICU setting as I was a critical care specialist, uh, a viral infection is largely managed to what we call a supportive care. And this applies to dengue or any other form of uh, hemorrhagic fevers, anything that we know about. Uh, perhaps there are very few antiviral uh, medications which are available and very few viral infections that we can treat, including, uh, you know, uh, HIV and possibly a, a virus called herpes simplex, very few of them. 
most of the other viruses are all we look at is what is called as uh, uh, supportive care. So I think that is the that will probably stand good even for uh, COVID. And uh, I would uh, even go to the extent of saying probably we will never find a uh, one on one antiviral medication, uh, unlike uh, a lot of antibiotics that we have. So I have a few more concluding questions that I will keep for the end. I, our audience is quite um, actively asking a lot of questions on the chat, I see. So I'll turn it over to Aditya Kemka, just um, to give you some context. At INCRED, we believe uh, that there will be tremendous amount of healthcare capacity that will need to be added. And, um, and this sector is going to see a lot of investment. So we've launched a um, healthcare fund, and Aditya Kemka leads that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Aditya to ask a few of his questions and then moderate the Q&A from the audience. And then I will give some, I'll ask some concluding questions at the very end. Sure, Vinita, and thank you, uh, Dr. Karant and uh, Professor Ivers for your time today. Uh, so just a few uh, questions from the audience, and some of these are obviously similar to what questions I had jotted down for myself. Firstly, you know, the most popular question that people want to know is, uh, when is the pandemic going to end, right? I mean, we have had so many waves, wave after wave in a few countries. I, I believe Japan is experiencing the fourth wave now. Uh, they've already had uh, two of them in India uh, and, a, and a few in US and other countries. Uh, when do you foresee a pandemic-free world? When do you see a normalized life? Uh, so question to you, Dr. Karant, and then I'll take Professor Ivers. view. Right. Uh, so I think uh, it is a little hard to predict uh, when the pandemic will come to an end. Uh, but I think we will see through the through this year, we will continue to see uh, COVID to be uh, afflicting our lives, uh, both in terms of our behavior and in terms of our infection. Now, if I can draw a leaf out of the previous pandemic experience uh, of the 1918 Spanish flu, uh, or even a couple of other pandemics or epidemics that we have seen. Each of these pandemics have a life cycle of about 18 months to 24 months. So if you take a leaf out of that, probably we are looking that at least a couple of years will be needed. I think a more pragmatic answer to your question, more than the timeline, would be to see how aggressively we can vaccinate ourselves and get to what is called as herd immunity. Possibly we still don't know what is the threshold cutoff for herd immunity with COVID, but uh, for a lot of other infections in the past, including influenza, we know that about 70% of the population or two thirds get, uh, get uh, immunized, either through getting an infection or through a vaccine. We do find that the uh, virus starts or the pandemic or the epidemic starts uh, winding down unless there is a mutation which may happen. So in that sense, um, I think we need to target that number. At least about 50 to 70% of our population needs to be vaccinated slash infected and develop antibodies. And you might find that there is a good grip we would probably get on the uh, vaccine, it's on the uh, pandemic itself. Sure. Uh, Professor Ivers, your view? Yeah, I think, you know, we don't know at all when the pandemic would end. Some pandemics are still going on, you know, tuberculosis, HIV infection. Um, we just don't really always um, understand exactly the dynamics and what the tipping point is in terms of how many people have to have had the infection. We don't really know if you've been infected with COVID-19, if 18 months in the future that would protect you from a future variant. So we don't really know if this will become an annual seasonal surge of cases or if we might actually reasonably expect that with a certain number of people infected that you know the the pandemic and unvaccinated the, the pandemic would just stop. So I you know like to try to be optimistic but at the same time want to be pragmatic and say that I I think we're probably going to see continued waves of these infections until we have a very good majority of people vaccinated and or um, infected, though we don't really know how long natural infection actually acts for the future. So I think with that amount of uncertainty, I think it means you have to kind of double down on a vaccination strategy, especially considering how impactful the infection is on individuals and on kind of local communities and economies. Fair enough. Uh, but, you know, you, we are sort of using vaccination and the end of transmission as substitutes here. Does 
a vaccinated individual not really get infected? Can he not transmit the disease even after he's vaccinated? Vaccination is, um, is dramatically reduces the likelihood of being infected in the first place. And it seems decreases even amongst those who are infected, if you have an escape infection, seems to reduce even the viral load of the person who's infected. And so that we hypothesize should translate into reduced transmission to others. Now, actually to go back to a comment we made earlier, it was the interpretation of this science which led our CDC to say that vaccinated people could now interact with each other without masks. There is some small amount of still infection amongst vaccinated and presumably some transmission, but it seems to be so small that it is no longer of public health, a public health concern. So it, it, they're not totally interchangeable vaccinated and transmission. And it will depend, I think, on different vaccines. So I think what we will see here in the future is as we have a um, kind of portfolio of vaccines and the real world use of those vaccines and studies that study the vaccinated and see what variants are occurring amongst vaccinated people. Is vaccination enriching certain variant populations? We don't really know all of that yet. So we'll know a little more in the future, I think how different vaccines play into the actual transmission. But overall, if you think about it, there's two reasons why vaccines reduce transmission. One is just because there's less people with the infection. So you're less likely to encounter another host that's susceptible. And then also it definitely seems as though those who do escape and become infected seem to have much less virus in their body and less symptoms. And we know that symptomatic people tend to transmit more readily than people who are asymptomatic as well. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, there's been a uh, you know, a lot of changes in the way the treatment protocol has evolved over the past, uh, you know, 12 months in COVID. And, you know, Professor Ivers, you were alluding to some of those changes in the U.S., whereas Dr. Currency was speaking for the Indian territory, how it has been working. Uh, there are certain new drugs which are under development for COVID treatment. And I just wanted to know if you guys have a view on some of these therapies. Uh, you know, one is Monopiravir being developed by Merck where they have seen some very encouraging data in the initial trials in terms of the antiviral activity of the novel molecule. Another is Roche's a cocktail drug, you know, castrizumab and imidivimab, where, you know, they're again seeing some good antiviral properties of the, uh, you know, of the drug. So any views on, you know, these new therapies and would these therapies sort of reduce the need for vaccination itself because they would maybe even have some prophylactic properties to it? Dr. Karanth, your view? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, vaccination and therapeutics are two different arms of the same uh, uh, of the same uh, uh, what i would say is the uh, you know approach uh, so uh, vaccination is prevention which is uh, done to ensure that somebody doesn't get infected which is what we want to prioritize treatment of course somebody gets unwell uh, it depends on how sick they are and that treatment could be for a mild disease and raging on to a very severe disease now, coming to the antibody mixture from Roche, it is still, uh, there is uh, positive data. I, should, I, would, I will say it like that. But uh, most of the uh, study, uh, most of the patients who were looked in, in that were uh, not very sick patients. And of course, it was uh, correct that very early on, they found that uh, people didn't progress on to severe disease, perhaps. There was, uh, and it has to be used very early. They found that, uh, uh, the number of days of hospitalization got less and the antibody response was sort of much better. So I think uh, there is good uh, early data to support it, uh, but I think it's too early to call it uh, that this is the, uh, again, panacea of uh, all the uh, cure that we can talk about, number one. And the same holds good for the uh, other drug as well. I think uh, these are still very early studies. We need more data to to be very categorically saying that, yes, this will be a game changer. I think any of the therapeutic interventions that we have known till today have not, not been shown to be a big game changer, if I may say. Understood. Professor, I was one for you on vaccination from the audience. Uh, so they, most of the people that uh, short questions on around the need for vaccination once you have gotten infected, do you still need vaccination if you have already been infected once? 
So that's one part of the question. The second part is, uh, if you have been vaccinated, how long do you think the protection against the virus lasts? Yeah, our current recommendations are that even if you had COVID-19, that you still should take a vaccine if you have access to a vaccine. I think, again, in the US, we now have vaccines at local pharmacies, in the grocery store. We have a surplus, really. I mean, not, you know, we have more vaccine around than people every day even wanting one. So, you know, it's easy enough to say, yes, even if you had COVID-19, go please get the vaccine. From a public health priority perspective, you could imagine that certain authorities might say, look, if you've had it, you go to the back of the line and let's vaccinate other people first. But it's still recommended. And that is partly because we don't actually know yet the answer to the second question, either for vaccination or for natural infection. We don't really know how long the immunity lasts. You know, we are hopeful that it lasts for a long time, but you know, some of the pharmacies um, companies are saying we will need boosters. I don't think we have enough scientific evidence for that yet, but I think the jury is still really out. We're going to have to see what happens and, you know, learn by doing as we are to try to understand what the duration of immunity is. I would hope it would be, um, you know, long lasting, but I don't think we exactly know that yet. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Karan, this one's for you. So, you know, in India, what we have seen that the second wave, the younger population, as you already discussed during your opening remarks, has gotten more infected. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, children also seem to be susceptible now to this virus, whereas earlier it was thought that children, children were probably not that susceptible. So is there really a prescribed age limit up to which the children can take vaccines? I know it's not open for vaccination in India yet for the children, but in US, for example, children have been taking vaccinations. So, yeah. you know, so uh, data from study, I think the Covaxin trial is on at the moment, the phase three trial for two years to uh, two to 18. So that will be, I think, mid June to late June. I think we should be having the preliminary reports of that. Uh, Pfizer, of course, still uh, they have uh, relaxed their age limit to 12, 12 to 18. So see, this is all based on studies. So unless we do a study in the younger population or in the children, uh, you know, we are talking about teens for Pfizer and once we get the data for Covaxin, we will know it better. Uh, so I think till we have some more data and unless we actually have what we say the results from the phase three trial, uh, it is very, very hard to say that, uh, you know, children can, uh, vaccine can be used on children or not. Uh, but whatever so far has been used, the interim analysis looks like it is quite safe. So, we have to wait for the reports of these, uh, for the results of this uh, study to come out. Fair enough. And, uh, you know, Dr. Karanth, in your experience, uh, once someone is, uh, you know, uh, had a COVID infection, and as Professor Ivers said that despite an infection, it is basically being advocated that one should take a vaccination. So uh, in your experience, how much, how much time should the you know, Indian patient wait post his recovery from COVID before he goes out and takes a vaccination? Yeah, so I think uh, whatever uh, uh, we know today is uh, we are learning constantly. I think initially they said six to eight weeks, and now you know that they've set up to three to six months. We can wait before the next, uh, before you go in for a vaccine. Uh, so this is still probably an evolving field, and uh, we will have to probably go by the recommendation which is given by the scientific community of that particular region uh, at that particular point of time. So this may change further, and as uh, uh, you know, uh, if we come to know that the immunity is long lasting, we may even say that you are a infected or a post infection person, go back to the back end of the queue. So I think mm -hmm. uh, right now we still don't know enough about it. So therefore, to keep matters simple, everybody needs to be vaccinated is what we are going by at this point of time, uh, making sure that you have adequate gap from the time you have had the last infection. Uh, the reason for the gap is, of course, because we need to ensure that there is good immune response, which does happen, and we don't want any complication arising out of the vaccine. And most importantly, the immune response to be optimal uh, needs to be given optimal time duration between the infection to the vaccine, actual uh, process of vaccination. Understood. Um, and uh, this one is for you, Professor Ivers. So, you know, given that Covaxin is not on the WHO list and, you know, we have already discussed that antibodies are not the best way to judge a vaccine's efficacy, but given that there is that perception and, you know, there are people in India who have already taken the first shot of Covaxin and they are just curious whether, you know, is it possible or is, the, is there a protocol where, where 
when they have taken the first shot of co-vaccine, can they go out and take a second shot of some other vaccine rather than co-vaccine? Is that is there any studies which you know substantiate that such a treatment protocol can be done, such a vaccination can be done? So I recently saw a study that was looking at mixing between AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccine and seemed to have a robust response. But I think you know there's no. I mean, I think the concern one might have in theory about um, multiple vaccinations would be that you would have some over response of your immune system and that you're triggering your immune system too much. But I think there's a lot of interest, obviously, in many global settings to see if there's a mix and match approach, if that's um, effective, if it's more effective, if it, because it's targeting different components of the immune System, if it might be better to do that. But I don't think there's any recommendation that I could give at this moment about doing that. Um, as Dr. Grant, Grant and I keep saying, I think so much continues to evolve. So I would say I wouldn't recommend it right now, but I wouldn't be surprised to see in the coming weeks and months more information coming out about what happens when you mix uh, types of vaccines, especially considering the scarce vaccines that we have. I think if I put my public health hat on, I would say add a vaccine dose, complete the you know complete the series from the from the series that you're in, and let others who don't have any vaccine get the check that they're in. You know, as opposed to being concerned. If you're still concerned about your own protection, of course you can still take in the other um, approaches. We know that masking is very effective. And so if you're in a situation where you can wear a mask and the people you're with can wear a mask and you've had one dose or two doses, even of a vaccine that maybe you think is not as effective as another vaccine, you're still going to be very well protected compared to someone who has none of those things. Correct. Fair enough. Uh, and, you know, we have been discussing the Pfizer vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, but uh, we haven't really spoken much about the Sputnik vaccine, the Russian vaccine. So, uh, Dr. Karan, the Professor Lewis, for both of you, I mean, any impressions, first impressions from this uh, uh, Russian vaccine? Um, I don't have much experience yet. I think it's just come to India, but whatever literature that we review shows uh, quite a good efficiency of about 91 odd percent. Uh, and also, I think it is quite practical to use it uh, because the storage is between, uh, you know, somewhere around minus 8 to minus 20 degrees, which is not too difficult to manage. Uh, so I think on those lines, if you look at it, it is uh, uh, equally good, if not better, to the COVID shield and the Covaxin that we have. Uh, so just to make the question a bit broader, I think uh, we should look at it uh, as uh, Professor, I was already mentioned previously to uh, as an answer to one of the questions. I think getting yourself vaccinated is important. It doesn't matter what kind of vaccine or what variety of vaccine you are looking at. And I'm pretty sure we get more data as we move further on that, you know, you can mix and match vaccines and you might find that there is some protection, if not a lot of protection that we will get. I think the emphasis should be on vaccinating rather than saying that, should I take this or should I take that? So um, rightly, as Professor Ivers put it, use uh, the vaccine. If you have already taken two doses, don't try to, you know, uh, usurp somebody else's chance. I think let somebody else get his or her shot and uh, ensure that you educate people to take more and more of the vaccine. I think that is what the priority has going is, is got to be. Professor Ivers, do you have a different view here? No, I, I, I totally agree. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Dr. Karan, this question is for you. Uh, Um, we seem to have lost Aditya. I think Aditya? we lost Aditya. Meanwhile, I can just uh, jump in and ask some questions of the uh, that the audience has sent. Um, so one of the questions that they've talked about is the excessive, Dr. Karan, the excessive use of steroids and what that means for this black fungus and, um, you know, that's being talked about in India. Yeah, right. Uh, so I think we should, uh, I do admit that the, uh, see, I, I'll just take a step backwards. Uh, we know that two proven therapies in COVID infections is one is steroids and two is blood thinners or what we call as anticoagulate, anticoagulants. Uh, yes, it is the only two proven therapies we know which has good data that it saves life. 
Now, having said that, picking up the right patient to actually have these two, uh, these two modalities of therapeutic interventions is very, very important. And just because there is a therapeutic modality, people have been using it and misusing it for every person, every particular person who comes positive. We have seen patients who come to us uh, with uh, steroid therapy, even when they are completely asymptomatic or very mild disease. So there is a there is a specific indication where steroids are used. There is a specific duration for why the steroids are recommended, and to a certain extent, a specific dose. Uh, you know, uh, without. Uh, uh, you know, uh, being too diplomatic, I think what uh, I have we have noticed as an ICU team is that we probably use far lesser dose of steroids than what a lot of uh, people use outside the ICU. So I think uh, steroids need to be used in a very selected population of patients in the right stipulated dose, because overdoing it has its own set of problems. I think that's the uh, that's the first uh, sort of semi answer to your question. Uh, the second. Part of it, uh, what you said was, uh, is there a relation to the fungus? Now, that is a bit of a debatable point because people have been using steroids for a lot of things, even in the past, and not many of these patients have actually come back to us with mucor. So whether the steroids itself is causing the mucor or there are other factors which are contributing to it is a bit of a debatable point at this point, at this stage. But we know that there are certain factors like high blood sugars, which happen as a consequence of steroids people who are diabetics and the COVID itself is known to cut off a certain specific arm of the immunity called the CD4 and CD8 suppressor cells, which have a direct bearing on exacerbating or worsening fungal infections. So I think at this point, uh, because this is a unique problem or a, you know, a fairly unique problem, which is localized to the subcontinent and more specifically to India, not many other countries have seen so much bulk or raise of uh, increase of uh, mucor uh, or what we call as black fungus uh, in, the, in the setting of COVID or post-COVID. So I think we still really have to look very hard at our data. Is it our practices or is it the therapeutics or is it just the disease and the genetic makeup of our population which is contributing this is what we are still unsure about. But yes, uh, having diabetes, high sugars which are attributable to steroids are two definite factors and to some extent the COVID infection itself may be playing a role. Uh, and I think it is very important to ensure that the dose of steroids that we use is going to be very very judicious okay these there's so many questions i know we only have about 10 or 15 minutes more so Aditya, yeah yeah so bonita i think i aggregated the questions so i just have uh, two more questions and then maybe i'll pass it on to you okay uh, so uh, just uh, uh, the, the one question i have here from the audience is about uh, you know the uh, the uh, once once normalcy comes back once people step out of their homes again right uh, how do you see uh, the immunity of the people? So COVID is supposed to immunocompromise the patients and, and the people around us also, because we are sitting back at home, we are not going out of our homes. So do you see that once people start a normal life again, whenever that might be, there will be a higher incidence of some of these infections and bacterial infections, et cetera, because the immunity levels in people would have just dropped a lot because they have not been venturing out of their homes. Uh, Dr. Sure, first yeah, yeah. I would like to reframe that question a bit differently. I think um, infections are higher in the post-COVID scenario. I don't think stepping out of house will uh, will sort of reduce your immunity. Maybe not. Yes, I mean you could always argue that you know uh, the psychological effects of being at home and the stressors of being at home may predispose to certain things, which which is a general sort of immune. Uh, boosting thing or a uh, general health concern, I would say. But I think in somebody who has uh, recovered from COVID, uh, we are seeing more and more infections of various types and the most recent one being post-COVID, I mean, uh, the black fungus or the mucor infections. So we would not completely rule out that people who have recovered from COVID, we don't know. It's a new virus on the, in town and the after effects of that, I think we will know in the next couple of years what are the newer problems that we see? And that is what we call as the post-COVID effect, which we have seen already beginning to happen in our ICUs and outside as well. Uh, I think uh, right now the raging fire is the COVID itself. So I think it's very important to understand that once we are releasing ourselves out of home, uh, we are still not fully a vaccinated population. I think full vaccination is seen only in 4%, which is abysmally low for the kind of uh, population that we have. So I think that is the first precaution we need to, uh, uh, we need to be aware of because uh, it is public memory is short, as we know, and uh, we cannot commit the same mistakes that we committed before the second wave. 
I think more than what will happen post COVID, I would like to emphasize that we are not at, not yet post COVID as a society. We are saying that there could be a third wave, that it could be fourth and many more. So we need to understand that uh, we have to first ensure that our behavior remains the way it is now. Uh, and I think that is more uh, is much more important. But yes, post COVID, uh, when somebody recovers from COVID infection, they are likely to be susceptible to a whole lot of infections, uh, which we probably need to learn more about as we go further on. Right. And Professor, I was your view on what's been happening in US. So obviously, the COVID wave has somewhat flattened out in US now. So have the post COVID recovered patients seen a bout of more infections or is it that the general population at large is not seeing any higher incidence of uh, other infections? So a couple of points. We have only rarely seen mucormycosis in our patients, and that has been amongst profoundly immunosuppressed patients. So I think um, you know it is of urgent scientific interest to understand much better what is exactly happening and what the epidemiology of mucormycosis is in India amongst the patients. I've um, done some consultations with colleagues in various facilities there, and most of those patients have had either very high blood sugars, very protracted steroid um, courses. We have been using very um, shortened courses of steroids, but also um, other immune inhibitors and other immune suppressant medications as part of kind of the care of patients. So I think it's very important to try to understand better what's happening there because obviously mucor is a really difficult um, infection to treat. It's very pernicious uh, and can be really life threatening. So that's one thing. We have not been, so we have not had the experience that we have considered that to be a post-COVID infection. In fact, we have, in the rare cases where we have had that, we have considered that to be a co-infection related to the profound immunosuppression that the patient has had. Otherwise, infection is not a major concern amongst people in our community who have suffered from COVID and have recovered. However, we are seeing quite high rates of what is being called post-COVID syndrome. And these are chronic fatigue, these are muscle concerns, these are brain fog, headaches, other neurological findings. Um, so we have a number of initiatives in our hospital, in other parts of hospitals around the US, looking at trying to understand better this syndrome of people who have been infected with COVID and seem to have recovered but still quite haven't gotten back to their usual self. So I think when you think about COVID in the community, we, obviously we think about hospitalizations and death because that has human impact and impacts our health system, but also even people who recover from moderate illness, many of them are having very protracted symptoms and that is an external um, impact on the health system and we don't totally understand those syndromes yet. But I will say infections, is not a major component of that. So we're not really seeing that people are susceptible to other types of infections. And just if I may, on your point about people staying home and immunity, what we saw in the US was almost no influenza this year. Very, 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 very low rates of influenza, probably because of all of the measures that were in place around COVID-19. Now, it's been great because normally we have very ill patients in our intensive care from influenza. So the question it will be that, is it possible a year from now or two years from now that we will have a big impactful influenza wave because nobody had influenza this year, but that's a minor, I mean, that's of interest, but it's really a minor public health concern at this, at this time. It's not something I wouldn't worry about immunity when I advise people to stay at home if they can. I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to be a major concern. Uh, just to add on, also we yes. need to understand that mucor itself is, uh, is more of a problem in this part of the world. Uh, even otherwise, I think we see a much higher incidence of mucor in our diabetics and such other people. Uh, I mean, of course, being uh, the fact that we probably have the highest number of diabetics in the world that could also be contributing. But definitely we know that being a diabetic and high blood sugars are two very important factors that lead to mucor. 
Uh, and that's why this question of whether steroids directly cause uh, mucor or directly responsible for mucor is a very debatable thing. But uh, in our treatment uh, modalities, we do see that uh, we struggle to get the sugars down uh, when people are on these uh, uh, doses of steroids. And uh, very protracted courses of steroids, as uh, Professor Ivers mentioned, are uh, given by uh, some of uh, our clinicians. And I think those are all uh, resulting in uh, some of these problems. Uh, yet another theory which is being um, uh, sort of discussed around is that uh, the way we have uh, looked at our oxygen uh, delivery, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, it's coming from the oxygen tubings, that we have diverted industrial oxygen to medical oxygen. So is that causing? So these are all uh, hypothetical questions which are still being looked at. But I think uh, we still don't have clear answers. And I think this is something which we have to look at as a priority. So I might, so as an infectious diseases specialist, I might, we might have to have a little uh, debate with my esteemed colleague in a different uh, scenario about the role of steroids in mucormycosis, because I think, but I think we are saying the same thing. Yeah. Certainly, so, you know, mucor is an environmental fungi. So it definitely, there are geographic differences in even what one's exposure to that fungus would be in the first place. So I definitely, I, I certainly can see that point. What I think what we see is that there are numerous um, underlying reasons what that might put a patient at risk of a, of a mucor infection. And they include diabetes with uncontrolled sugar. They include steroid use and prolonged steroid use. And they include other immunosuppressing medications. So certainly, if you compound those things and you add those things up, you're going to have a patient that is much more at risk. But so, but I agree that there are many factors that need to be untangled to understand better what exactly is contributing to this major um, kind of epidemic within an epidemic in some ways, or with COVID. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not denying that steroids is responsible for that. But if you just look at purely the studies, which have uh, you know a lot of other patients are on steroids, but they don't end up with these kind of mucor. So it could be not only the steroid, but there's something beyond it. And what we think is could be the hyperglycemic effect of steroids perhaps causing it. But yes, if you look at it from an immunological perspective, steroids do have an effect on the uh, you know that arm of uh, the immunity as well. Understood. Thanks a lot for that view. Uh, just one final question from the audience for me, and that was for me. So. Uh, they say that, you know, if a COVID is going to be short-lived, maybe a year or two, then the pharma companies which have created all this capacity to create this COVID-related therapies, what happens to that capacity? What happens to those, uh, you know, uh, plants that have been created to produce these drugs? The response to that is simply that, you know, many pharma companies, companies are, are for these plants, these plants are fungible in the, in the way they are designed. So if you want to stop producing and you want to start producing something else, the plants are other drugs. So closing remarks and, uh, you know, anything you may want to add. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, thank you to both Dr. Ivers and Dr. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Sure. Okay. So um, before, um, before I thank you, actually, uh, I have one con uh, concluding question for each one of you. So Dr. Ivers, you've talked about a global unified response, the need for a global unified response. Uh, what should that be? You know, I have to, we've talked a lot about vaccines and the United States and Europe and Canada have ordered vaccines from the world, you know, have, in, have kind of hedged their bets on COVAX and have contributed dollars to COVAX, but then separately behind the scenes negotiated with pharmaceutical companies to make sure that we have this massive surplus of vaccine. And I mentioned today, now you can go to any pharmacy almost and get a vaccine. This is you know, nice for Americans, but it doesn't really seem like a good idea for the world when you think about a pandemic and variants and just a global humanity. So I think that global leaders really need to come together and say, how can we ensure that we, and by the way, we can see how the surge in India impacted vaccine production for the rest of the world. And Africa, CDC, 
needing COVAX doses that were going to come from India. So we're all so interconnected. The idea that one country or one you know, subcontinent could isolate itself and try to just work alone is really not the way forward. So I would love to see much more global collaboration on trying to address the problem as everybody's problem. Like we're all in this together. And that was some of the narrative that we heard from global leaders this time last year. And so I think it was very disappointing to see that they, many of them only really meant that uh, as, as at the podium in words, and they didn't really follow through on it. So I think we have to be able to come together to share the technology around the vaccines, to collaborate on the manufacturing capacity to make sure that we can produce the billions of doses that we need and that when one plant is down, the other can scale up. I think that's gonna be really important. Mm. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Karant, my concluding question to you, you've obviously been in the trenches. You've been playing a very important role in the critical care units and saving many, many lives. And all the doctors in India are uh, really putting you know, their lives at risk to save everybody. So um, I was reading somewhere that the herd immunity in India is only going to be reached in mid-2023, later than, say, most other countries. Some countries like US is supposed to reach um, end of this year or 22 mid and most developed countries by mid 22 at the latest. How do we and you, the healthcare professionals prepare for the next wave and the future variants in India? And how do we build the healthcare capacity that is yeah. needed? Any words of wisdom? So I think uh, we have to learn from the mistakes that we did prior to the second wave. So the, this has to be a twofold strategy. One is, as Professor Ivers has already told, vaccine, vaccine, vaccine the population. That is the only way by, uh, only sure shot way of actually speeding up the herd immunity. Uh, now that is one arm of it. But I think the second important thing is that we have now learned that there is there has been a second wave. It cannot be complacent. Uh, we have to get ready for the third wave. And there's already prediction that the third wave is going to be hitting an even younger population. So I think ramping up beds, ramping up availability of drugs, oxygen, production and distribution of each of these things, I think has to be a priority. Now, um, I think what we need to look at from a more specific uh, specs perfect, uh, perspective, uh, perspective would be that we have to make sure that we have the capacity to ramp up in a very short time. You know, say for example, you have a major institution or a hospital ensure that you can keep oxygenated beds around that hospital rather than you know uh, isolate it from different parts of the city ensure that there are supply chains maintained for all these important drugs and there are only very few things which are going to be uh, required you know it could be things like remdesivir which again you know it's there or not there may not make much of a difference uh, but make sure you have oxygen you have enough uh, uh, oxygen delivery devices which include ventilator non invasive high flow nasal cannula all these kind of uh, devices and uh, make sure that there is appropriate education to people as well. Uh, I think these are some of the things which uh, which we need to ensure and uh, uh, being uh, uh, so savvy digitally, I think, or being one of the software hubs of the world, I think that is something we have, uh, I should admit, uh, failed to use uh, in both our pandemics. You know, there's a lot of talk about going digital, going this, going that. I think that is something we can really use because we do find that, especially in the initial phase of the wave, uh, people just get admitted because I'm COVID positive, I just get admitted in the hospital and they block the beds for people who really deserve it. So having a graded or what we call as a stepladder approach to the uh, to addressing this problem of uh, you know who gets admitted and who are the people who really deserve hospital beds and the high-end ICU beds need to be really put into perspective. Uh, and uh, I think we have to understand that we have to build our capacity to at least reach, reach 400,000 cases a day, because that is what we saw on this wave. Now, if it is less than that, good for all of us. But if it is more than that, I think at least we have to be ready for this number, because this is a number we have seen this time. Uh, it could be worse or it could be better. We don't know. But I think not to drop the guard. I think we need to understand that the whole of this year we are going to battle COVID, whether we like it or not. Um, and uh, I think starting from the top leadership, uh, political leadership down to the grassroots uh, people in the villages and the deep rural uh, areas, we have to be very, very, uh, you know, uh, 
aware of this fact. As you know, the tribal belts in the country have now been hit. I'm sure we will not even know the number of deaths which are happening in the remote parts of uh, the jungles where uh, most of our tribal people live. You know, you'll just find that people just die and lose their lives. So I think whatever we can do to save every possible life is important. Uh, and uh, whether we like it or not, certain measures like lockdown is, might become a necessity as we saw from our experience in the first wave and the second wave. Only after lockdowns got imposed in various parts of the country in this wave, we could get a hang of the positivity rate and the spread of the transmission of the infection. And there is a, there are a couple of good papers which have shown that the mortality also comes down by about 40 odd percent when you actually employ these epidemiological measures. Uh, I know it's a battle between life and livelihood, but as you know, this wave has cost more lives and livelihoods than we thought about in the first wave. So I think it is a balance between the two that we need to ensure, because if we are alive, we can talk about livelihood. If you are not alive, I think the question of livelihood just doesn't come, uh, come around. So I think uh, it, it is to be a unified uh, vision that we need to have. And uh, I think we have our own experience to fall back on. Unfortunately, we failed to learn from the uh, uh, you know, experiences of the rest of the world, uh, which uh, I should say was a very foolish thing uh, from our, uh, our, ourselves. I think a wise man learns from others' experiences. I think we didn't learn from others, but at least I'm hoping we are wise enough to learn from our own experience. And what we need to understand is, uh, I think, being at the forefront, uh, you know, we do see the uh, helplessness of uh, ourselves and the people because there are so we were so desperate to even get beds for people, and uh, it was really a you know a pathetic scene to see uh, to have the kind of state we were in, uh, and I think being uh, there in the front end, it was uh, really very painful to see that we were not able to help a whole lot of our uh, population. No, I think you, um, Dr. Karanti, very nicely explained why, um, you know, um, you're also have, uh, often giving medications because when it when all uh, things look like they're so desperate, then you try every hope and every treatment to, you know, survive uh, or, you know, make the patient survive. So that's a very important point. And I think uh, um, that I've taken away as well. And um, I think I can't thank you, doc, both Dr. Ivers and Dr. Karant, enough for you know shedding so much wisdom and sharing so much knowledge and um, giving us all this advice um, today, despite all your busy schedules. And I hope, Dr. Karant, you get some rest before you go back into the trenches. And Dr. Ivers, keep keep uh, focusing on the global health policy issues so you can you know you can uh, continue uh, to advocate um, solutions for the whole world right now that we desperately need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, uh, if there are no more questions or nothing else uh, anyone wants to add or say, we can conclude unless Dr. Ivers or Dr. Karanti want to add any final concluding remarks. Just thank you very much for inviting me to the conversation, and it was great to meet with you, Dr. Kranth, and best wishes. Pleasure is mine. Same here too. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and it was always a pleasure, Professor Ivers. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone, for attending the call, and that concludes the call. Thank you. Thank you.